The limits will eventually go away once we get to 3.2. Um, and I wrote 3.2, didn't I? I should have written 3.1. Um, when we get to 3.2, you're gonna get real mad at me because 3.2 is all about the shortcut. So we do all this work, a lot of work, in my opinion, all of this work to get these answers. And then in 3.2, they're gonna be like, oh, by the way, you could have just done this, okay? <laughs> it's frustrating, but we need to learn where derivatives are coming from, why they exist, what they are exactly, and all that good stuff, okay? So that's what they talk about. Or they, me, but I talk about in the uh, video for 3.1. Okay. Now I do go over a few examples, but I wanted to go over a few more just to kind of hone it all in, right? To get it stuck in the process. Okay. So this one, I don't like that it's number two in your web assigned, but I picked it um, because I think number one, I already had an example like it in the video. And so I picked number two. Normally, I like to just do the, the derivative first, figuring out what that slope of the tangent line is, and then I like to go give you the tangent line later, okay? Um, but they're asking you for both pieces right now. So anytime that they ask you, oh, no, it's not. It's just asking for the slope, isn't it? Perfect. And this is a nice short one that I wanted. We'll get to the other one later. Um, so I did have a question in the chat, in the discussion, uh, and it's a good question. Um, they were saying, what's the difference between this and this? And somebody else answered that question further in the discussion. Um, but what is the difference between those two? What does this one represent? F prime is how you say it, but what is F prime? The derivative of F, exactly. Um, and this one is what? Just the original function, okay? So notice here, and they don't, it doesn't matter if the function is called Frank or Gary, right? It's just a name. So even if you don't have F, if you have G and they're asking you to do the derivative, that's G prime, okay? Are we ever gonna have to worry about that? You're saying like G prime or F prime? You just write it. Uh -huh. Is that gonna be considered a number later on down the road? The little apostrophe little thing? Line? No. It's not a one, right? It's not a one. It's apostrophe. I can't draw apostrophe though. I don't know how to like that, maybe. <laughs> I don't know how to draw an apostrophe. So I just draw a little right. Okay, but yeah. <laughs> just like commas, I always do this, but that's technically not what a comma looks like. It's like that, right? But who does that? Do you do that? I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know anybody that does unless they're like real into their English writing. I know I had an email up from a student, not in this class, but another class, and uh, 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 somebody was hovering over me and going, can you understand that email? And I said, I don't care if I can understand it. If I'm confused, I'll ask them what they were saying. But I try to understand. I said, I don't get mad at people with their grammar. What I get mad at people with is that they don't write the math correctly. I was like, I'm not a grammar teacher. <laughs> I'm a math teacher. I use bad grammar all the time too. So it's not um, that's not my job. I said, plus you never know. People don't have English as their second language. I mean, they're trying their best there. Why would you, you know? But anyway, um, if they're asking me for the slope of the tangent line, okay? I think they represent it like this and with the subscripts of tangent, right? So that's the slope of the tangent line, all you need to do is find f prime of whatever number, whatever x value they're giving you. Okay, so make sure you know that c is an x value. I'm just making sure that I was recording. Oh, I am recording, but you know what I didn't do? They share my screen, so I'm talking and talking and can't see. There we go. What happened? There we go. No, that's not the one I want. That's the one I want. Uh, 
Okay. So if I'm asked to find the slope of a tangent line, now here they didn't call my function Frank, right? They called it Gary. So either way, I still need to figure out the M10, which is going to be G prime of what X value? Yeah, this one is my X, right? So it's going to be of negative three. Well, in order for me to figure out what G prime of negative three is, I first have to figure out what G prime is, right? So in order for me to do that, I just want to figure out what G prime, general G prime, not specific G prime for specific X value. And that's where that limit definition came into place. And so this, and I had some questions about the notation and I'm gonna mention something very handy right now, okay? Where all these threads are coming from. But I think the difference quotient is going to be G, because I'm talking about Gary now, of X plus this change in X minus the original Y value over, and it's really this X value minus that X value. But what is X plus delta X minus an X? Won't the X's cancel? Just delta X, okay? Now, I had some questions about the format of like this whole delta X thing, okay? Now, I was doing the lecture and so I'm trying to be real consistent with the book, but there are other books in existence. There are other authors, other people who do it differently and for good reason, okay? Our book is written by an author named uh, Larson, Ron Larson, he's still alive, I've met him. Um, he's a weird guy, but I mean, he's with mathematician is not weird, so <laughs> we're all weird. <laughs> um, that is actually him, yes. Yes, it is, which I love because not all authors do that. Sometimes they just hire out somebody else to explain what they're trying to explain. So I love that he does that. But yes, he is that guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he does it this way and he does it for good reason because he's representing that delta X means that change in the X value, right? And whatever change you have in the X value, it's of course gonna change the Y value, right? Um, then that's what this represents, the change in the Y value. But, Computation-wise, this delta X causes some issues when people try to write stuff, okay? So what you can do is follow another author. His name is Stewart. And whenever we pick calculus books, it's always a battle between Larson and Stewart. Um, some teachers like Larson, some teachers like Stewart. I like both of them, so I really don't care. But here's another version. It is an H. Yes, it is. So all they do is instead of using delta x in there, when they do all the algebra, they use h instead. And one single letter is a little bit easier to look at algebraically than this little combined symbol, okay? Because then people start thinking that it's delta times x, and it's not. It's delta x, which represents the change in x, okay? So way away from that confusion, I'm going to kind of switch over authors <laughs> and not use the delta x one. I'm just going to use h one. Okay. Now, if you're taking the test and I say, I do not give you what the definition is. Okay. So this part, I do not get to me. Okay? You have to remember this definition. Um, but there are problems in the test that say find the derivative using the limit process. Because in 3.2, we're going to find out how to do derivatives and how to Okay? But there are, I think, two problems that specifically say you have to do it by the limit part. And if you do it the shortcut way and that's it, you won't get the points, right? You won't get the explanation points. You get the answers probably, but not the explanation points. And you already know the explanation points is where all the money lies, right? So <laughs> you definitely need to remember this. But I'm actually just remembering only okay to do the H or the delta X. Just don't get them confused. Okay, okay. and then go with that one. Personally, since I know that there was confusion after that discussion, I'm just going to start using H from now on. Okay. Um, also, because I don't want to use you when we start doing the algebra. The algebra is already like, <laughs> so I don't want to make an extra factor in there with that delta X. Okay. 
So if I'm going to do this one, that means that I need to plug in x plus h into this function that they gave me, okay? So everywhere there was an x, right? Here there was an x inside the parentheses, and that's the expression that was here. But now I have this in the parentheses, so that's the expression that needs to get multiplied by 5 thirds. So that would be 5 thirds times x plus, five, x plus h, and then I have my plus five, okay? So that whole thing represents this one guy in the numerator. And I forgot my limit, but I'll write it down in a second. Then I'm gonna write my minus sign, and then I'm gonna put g of x exactly as it was, which was 5 thirds x plus five. So I didn't write lin, and if I were taking my test, I'd get deducted, wouldn't I? So g prime of x is lin as h goes to zero. And then this whole thing is over what? h. And you have to keep in mind what the goal is. The goal is to cancel that h, okay? Because you can't plug in h equal to zero because then you would have zero in the bottom, right? Oh, that was a nice thing to have in mind. People were writing this and then saying that that meant that the limit does not exist. Or they were saying that the limit, that meant it was infinity, something like that. This, what kind of form is it? We have zero over zero. It's called the something form. Anybody remember? Indeterminate form. What is the definition of the word indeterminate? It means you cannot determine. So how are you going to tell me that this means that that's the answer? Or this means that that's the answer? You can't. This is indeterminate. You cannot determine nothing. Okay? So don't do that. <laughs> that was a weird one that I saw. I'm going to have to spray that down the right there. So half of you don't give me markers. I'm going to do So let's see. What do we think we need to do for the algebra here? Yes. Is there a reason that this bracket needs to be here? Other than just for me to visually separate this function from that function? No, right? So I don't need to rewrite those. So I'm not going to rewrite the big giant bracket, okay? But you're right. I am going to distribute that 5 thirds. So I have 5 thirds times x plus 5 thirds times h. And my plus 5 is still there. But is there a reason that this bracket needs to be there? Yes, you have to distribute the negative. Uh huh. There, it says minus that whole thing, right? So then I have to minus each one individually. So then that would be minus 5 thirds x, and a negative and a positive would be minus 5. Yes, you can. Positive five, negative five, I have no more five. Yeah, five thirds what? Five thirds x minus five thirds x. Mm -hmm. You can, if you're great. <laughs> so you must be great if you wanna do it. These things have red marks on them, don't they? So aren't they all gone, right? So I canceled them. All of these guys are gone. So if you can visualize this as gone, and I think I did that in the video, I covered it, right? If you can imagine those guys as completely gone, don't you have two factors in the numerator and then one factor in the denominator? And one of those factors is the same, isn't it? And you can cancel factors. You can never cancel terms. You can cancel factors on a fraction, okay? So I can cancel the H and the H. And so yes, you can go boom, boom. And what is the only thing I have left? I'm actually going to do that each and the two color. Right, five thirds. And what is the limit of any constant? Mm -hmm. You have nothing to plug H into, right? So it's just going to be itself. And luckily, it's just one little number. I got g prime of x equals 5 thirds. So what happens if you try to do g 
g prime of negative three. Is there any place to plug in the negative three? No. So the response is just the same, five thirds. So then that tells me that m10 is what? Five thirds. Because these are the same exact value, right? Well, that one, it was weird because it had a fraction in it, but it's pretty easy, I guess, algebraically, right? It's not too bad. I just kind of wanted to warm us up before we start going into radicals and all kinds of weird stuff. Okay. Now, chapter two was a very, very much theoretical. This chapter is more algebraic, okay? So you know, chances are people do a whole lot better on this test than they did on the last one. Just because it's hard to shift from doing algebra your whole life to the now theoretical stuff, okay? So this one does have a lot of algebra, which is usually what students struggle with, but they're also more comfortable with, it's weird. <laughs> okay, second one I have is like number six on web assignment. So the other ones were either like ones that were in the video or there were certain problems in there that I intentionally did not want to do in class because I wanted you to think about it. And then if you still can't figure it out, you can text me, right? Um, so there might be some problems between two and six that, but I, I did it on purpose. I want you to struggle, right? I want you to figure it out on your own. And if you can't, I'm here. But I at least want to give you that opportunity to try. Um, number six is this one. This is exactly the same termination uh, verbiage that you'll see on the test. It says find that if there's a problem from 3.1. Um, it find the derivative of the function by the limit process. So again, right now, that's all we know. But as soon as you get to 3.2, you're going to know another way. And don't do this problem that other way. Okay. I say that, but I promise you somebody's going to do it. Didn't I say it like four or five times in class that one day that one sided limits always exist? And I, there were four people that put DNE on the one sided limit problem. Four people. So I say it, but <laughs> you got to hear it, right? And let it sink in. This is another one of those things where I say, but someone still does it. I hope nobody does it this time. So then if I have to do the limit process, let's start off with that definition. And I'm gonna start off with the Stewart author definition, just cause it might look a little bit easier in the computation. Now I like to use brackets. Um, if you don't use brackets, I mean, there's nothing like super wrong with you not using brackets, but I will tell you this. If you don't put this guy in parentheses or brackets, chances are you're not going to distribute that minus and then the whole thing's wrong. And you'll not recognize it because stuff won't cancel like it's supposed to. Essentially, all of the terms of f of x are supposed to cancel every single time, okay? So we're gonna plug in and this one's, oh, uh, I don't like it, but... We have this cubed and then the same thing squared, right? And then f of x is just the original 2x cubed plus 2x squared. Now, I don't know. Sure, always. So you have that limit, um, Does anybody know what x plus 
like two of them together, foil, and then that, and distribute it with the other one. Nobody learned the quick rules? Yes, yes, you're getting there. Yeah. What is it? Almost. Yeah, you're good. You're on the right path, though. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is if you have an expression like, um, oh, what is it? It's a plus b to the power zero. Doesn't it equal one? Right. If you have a plus b to the power one, you're just going to get a plus b, right? Those would be your coefficients, one and one. If you have a plus b to the power two, what happens here is that you get a squared and then a b and then b squared, and those are the coefficients, okay? What happens when you have a plus b cubed is this is a cubed, then a squared and a b to get a cube, right? And then a by itself and b squared to make a cube and then b cubed. So while the a is decreasing an exponent, the b is increasing an exponent. Okay. So there are no Bs, one B, two Bs, three Bs, right? Three As, two As, one A, no A. Okay. But that is using Pascal's triangle. Okay. And these are all positive. If you have negatives in here, then you have to basically raise the, uh, the first one will be positive. Uh, most likely, it depends on what your A is, because if A has a sign and B has a sign, that will affect it, okay? So if I had this, minus b, then what happens when I cube this first guy? Is it going to be positive or negative? It'll be negative. What happens when I square this guy, but then when I multiply it by this guy, it'll go back to negative. And then what happens if that guy stays the same, but I square this one? It'll be negative. And then what happens if I cube this guy? It'll be negative. So it's just coincidence that they all ended up negative. If I made one positive and one negative, it will affect it, okay? So in mine, over here, I'm just gonna plug in what it's gonna end up being. Uh, my coefficient first is gonna be one, and it's gonna be x cubed, then a three, an x squared, and an h, then a three, an x, and an h squared, and then a one with the h cubed. Now, that's what I did because I know how to do it, right? Yes. Pascal's triangle. Uh huh. From the one, three, three, one. Now, we could have done this, and if you do not remember Pascal's triangle, and you're sitting there and you're like, I know I can use Pascal's triangle, I probably won't put this on the test, by the way, because it's crazy, but if you have it on the homework. Um, if you don't remember Pascal's triangle, then just do it the old school way, where you multiply two of them, and then you multiply the other one, okay? There is nothing wrong with doing that. So you take, leave that one alone, because I like the short one in the front. And then foil these. You get a squared plus a b plus a b plus b squared. Then you can combine the two middle ones because they're both a b. And then you can distribute the a and the b. So you get a cubed plus 2a squared b plus a b squared. Then now distribute the b. a squared with the b plus 2a with the b squared and then b times b squared is b cubed. And then you'll notice that I have a squared b here and a squared b there, but there's two and one, that makes the three. Here I have one a b squared and here I have two a b squared. So I have three a b squared. And then the last one is b cubed. Are these the same? They're not in the same order but 
<clears throat> so don't forget, you can go back to this. Okay? What I don't want you to do is write this. Not because I don't want you to, but because it's wrong. Um, and then say this. Or to tell me that this is a cube plus b cube. Is it? It's not, right? You're missing two whole terms in there, okay? So there's no rule that says you could do this. There's a rule that says if you have two things multiplied cubed, you could cube each one. But there's never a rule that says if you're adding or subtracting two numbers that you can cube each one, okay? So it's worth mentioning because it does happen. I wouldn't mention it if it didn't happen a million times throughout the last 12 years of MTG. Okay, so I got rid of the front bracket because I already did the little uh, squaring stuff and there's really no purpose for having the bracket. The only reason you would have the bracket is if there's a focus to the side or if there's a focus to the side. But it's not here, okay? But over here, even though there's no exponent being applied, there is a focus to the side. And so I do want to distribute it in. So this would be minus 2x cubed and then minus 2x squared. So this is why I don't put this problem on a test because it's like way too long. Um, it's just a lot of writing. So what do I do next then? What am I going to factor out? Am I going to factor out? Anybody else have any ideas? Uh -huh, both of them, right? Yeah. So we'll do this one, this one, this one, and then that one. And here I only have three of them. So, so then what will be the next term? Yeah, there you go. Six, and then six. Now two h cubed. Oh, what's the next term after two x squared? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the last two guys, right? You got it. Now remember, all of f should be canceling. All of F should go away. Mm -hmm. So now here's the weird part. I don't have just one thing on the top now, right? Now remember, the goal is to cancel the H at the bottom, right? So how are you going to do that? Right. And I could have done it here, but I didn't. So bear with me while I write all this down and then I fix it. And then I have just H under there. But yes, in order for me to cancel, I have to have factors, right? Not terms. Right now I have just a bunch of terms. I cannot cancel anything when there's a bunch of terms. Only when there's factors. What's the difference between a factor and a term? Correct. But just by definition, what, what is a factor and what is a term? Exactly, added or subtracted. Mm -hmm. You got it. You can. No, we'll do it just as you asked. <laughs> yeah, it still has a factor of two. Oh, I factored one of these x's out. <laughs> okay, make sure this is right because, like I said, my brain does weird things. So if I were to multiply that, I would get this one. If I were to multiply that, I would get that one. If I multiply these, yes. 
if I multiply those, yep. And if I multiply these, yep. I have to, I, so I just have to check because if I don't, I will be missing. I was trying to tell my daughter, like, hmm, when you go to your appointment today, you have to leave by 150. And she's like, 150, my appointment's at 130. And I'm like, oh, I meant to subtract 20 from 130, not add 20 to 130. It's like, yeah, you're all off. And that's because somebody from the Cal 2 class asked me a question. I couldn't answer it. And I was like, am I read yet? Because <laughs> I was so frustrated. I couldn't answer the question. And then I went back to my office. It took like two days. So I was like, mm -hmm. like, I obviously don't work well under pressure. <laughs> Normally I do, but that day was off. Oh, so then now I do have factors, right? Because don't you have two times H times that other big thing, right? And so you can cancel this H factor with this H. And then I'm not going to rewrite all of that. I'm just going to actually take the limit. Who is becoming zero? H. So what I'm going to have is that two still on the outside, and only the H is going to become zero. And then I'm going to close my parentheses. And I don't have a denominator no more, so I don't need to write that. What's going to happen at this term? It's zero. It's just one big fat zero. What happens to this term? Zero. Same thing. And then that one is obviously zero, right? So when you add zeros, do they change anything? No. So it's just going to have 3x squared plus 2x. And if you really wanted to, you could distribute the two back in there. And you get the same answer that you would have if you hadn't factored out the two, like what's here. So if you would have just left that and factored out the H, just the H, you still would have had the same result. Okay. So the reason you said you were able to use the right substitution was because we uh, reduced that H and the denominator to allow this to be a zero. Right. I call them the problem child. That was the problem child. As soon as you get rid of the problem child, you don't have a problem anymore. You can, you can proceed. Okay. I shouldn't say that because I don't think that about children. But <laughs> whatever is in the bottom, yeah, the H. The H is always going to be the problem. Back in the lecture and the video, it was delta X. That was the problem, right? The single H. It gets weird when those radicals are involved, which I think I have another one for those for that one. Because then there's other stuff down there with the H, but it don't matter. As long as you get rid of the H, we don't care what the other junk is. Okay. I have two more and then a, a little note for some other problems in the section. Get up there. So I, I have mentioned this before, but I wrote it in here in my directions because in WebAssign, it doesn't tell you to graph the function. It says use a graphing utility, but are we allowed to use graphing utilities? No. So whenever you see it say that, if it's asking you to graph it with a graph utility, then just graph it by half. If it's just asking you to use the graphing utility to confirm, then you can just ignore that. Okay, you don't need to confirm with the graphing calculator. Um, but for this one, it said graph the function using a graphing utility or something like that. And we're not going to have one. So I'm just going to straight graph it. Okay, we'll get to that one later. And there's two ways to graph. Um, you can use the transformations, which is what I use. I mean, Remember, as a teacher, I'm basically taking the same class over and over and over and over, right? So I remember all the little bits in college algebra, but I don't ever assume that y'all are going to remember absolutely everything, okay? So I try to either refresh your memory and show you how I do it, or I can give you another alternative, okay? And so when we graph square root of x minus 1, I will give you two different ways to do it, okay? So this one says, consider our function square root of x minus 1 and the point 5, 2. 
And it says, find this equation of the tangent line to the graph of f at the point given or the given point. And then it just has y equals and where the sign and then the block. So we need to type the rest of the equation for the tangent line. Okay. Now, when you're writing any tangent line, um, it's always going to be in the form y equals mx plus b. It's a line, right? So this is what they're asking me for. And we know that that thing is m10, right? Because isn't it the slope of the tangent line? Mm -hmm. And we know that that is f prime of x. Right? So in order for me to just figure out what that little m is, I'm going to have to figure out what the derivative is. Okay? And this one, it has a radical, which is why I picked it, so that I can get practice again with you guys um, asking questions as we go with this one. Okay? But I do have to do it with the limit because that's the section we're in. We haven't learned anything else different in this section yet. Okay? Um, not only that is how do you get the equation? If I have to have m, I know how to get m, but how would you get b? Does anybody know? You let x equal zero? Okay, if you let this guy equal zero, you would still have y and b as variables. So how would you figure out what b is? What you could do is you could use this point. And if I figure out what that number is, and then I use that x value and that y value, couldn't I use computation to figure out what the b was? Right? So that will be our game plan. So we have to plug in a number for this, which we have right here. We have to plug in a number for that, which we'll work on. And then we have to plug in a number for that, which is right here. Okay. And then we should be able to calculate that B. So let's do the hard part. So for part A, so for part A, I have to do F prime. That's my goal. Actually, I'll do M10 first and then F prime. The goal is really to figure this thing out. But we know that that's defined as this. And we know that this is defined as the limit as h goes to zero of the difference quotient. In algebra, we did have you do this before in algebra. I don't know if you remember, but it was like in chapter 2.6 or something. They had you do this. And the reason why they had you doing that was because they knew you were going to have to do it later in chapter. So, what is the first part going to look at before the minus? What is that going to look like? I'm going to put it in brackets. Well, mine's one. Oh, yeah. Yours might be four. Yeah, sorry. You're good. Okay, so that's what we have there. And then the other parentheses or brackets is just the original, right? Be careful right here if you wrote down what I wrote down. What's supposed to go in that parentheses? And so then it's just the, an original, right? Yeah, I had H in there, not the right definition. And then down at the bottom is just H. Now my goal is to cancel that H, right? Right now, it does not look like that is ever gonna happen, okay? Uh -huh. What was the trick in the radicals when we were doing um, regular limits? I mean, we're still doing limits, but it's still regular limits. But what was the trick when you had radicals in the limits in the last right. chapter? Uh -huh, multiply by the conjugate. Whatever you do to the top, you'll do the same to the bottom, right? So you don't change the problem. So 
So I'm going to write this like this. And do I need these parentheses? There's no exponent and no coefficient. So I do not need them. And then I have the other radical, x minus 1. What sign goes in the middle? Correct. Because right now it was a minus. And then you do exactly the same at the bottom. Now, remember the goal. The goal is to cancel that H at the bottom. And you cannot cancel it unless it's a what? A factor. So does it make sense to distribute that H? Because then it's going to be part of terms instead of a factor, right? So your hard part is going to be in the numerator, not the denominator. Denominator is just going to stay H times that weird thing. What's going to happen when you multiply conjugates so that I can avoid boiling? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you multiply them, I'll use my hands just because it's easier to write one. When you take this thing times the outside one, this one, there are two different radicals, aren't they? This radical and that radical. So when you multiply them together, they're just going to be next to each other. And a positive times a positive is what? Positive, right? So you have both of those radicals next to each other, but it's positive. Well, when you multiply the inside, don't you have the same two radicals next to each other, but with a minus sign? So when you're foiling, right, the F O I L, the outside and the inside do what? Cancel. You only end up with the first ones and the last one. So what happens when I take this times this? It's squared because it's exactly the same thing. So you end up with x plus h minus 1, but the whole thing is squared. Then the L, which is like the last two guys together, um, would be if I put this guy times this guy. So if I get Right, because you have a negative radical times a positive radical, right? We have a negative radical times a positive radical, which means it'll be a negative, but this times itself is squared. And we have that the exponent property, right? That says if the power and the index of the radical match, they basically undo each other, okay? Because radicals and powers are inverses of each other, just like add and subtract, right? If I'm adding x and I'm subtracting x, don't they go away? Well, if I'm squaring and square rooting, they just both go away. So then all I really have in that numerator is just x plus h minus 1 all by itself. This one's more difficult. What do I get for the second one? It's a little bit tricky. I will get x minus one, right? Because the house and the two cancel. But this minus, doesn't it apply to both of them? So that whole thing is gonna be a minus, but I have to remember to put this in parentheses. If I don't put that in parentheses, is this one going to cancel with this one? They'll both be minus one, wouldn't they? But with it in parentheses, I have to distribute the negative and it'll become positive, and then it will go away. So like I mentioned in the very, very, very first day of class, it's not necessarily going to be the calculus concepts that are going to be the issue. It's going to be algebra that is going to be the issue. Okay. Somewhere along the line, the more steps there are, the more chances you have of making a mistake, right? <laughs> That's literally what's happening. Number two. 
But now here, the x should wipe out, right, with the minus x. The negative one should wipe out now with the positive one. And if I imagine all of this red stuff that I strike out, not there. So if I imagine it's not there, what's on the top? Exactly. But what happens if the h cancels out? I'll use blue. Correct. Always, right? It's not necessarily imaginary, but it's invisible. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, because there's literally an invisible one coefficient, right? So even though you canceled the h, that invisible one coefficient now has no choice but to become invisible. Okay. Now, we have gotten rid of the copper tile. It's gone. That little H that I couldn't put in is gone. So now I should be able to plug it in. I see people squinting, so I'm going to zoom in. <laughs> I'm blind too, so I totally sympathize. <laughs> I guess like, this is my class. I just didn't do like this. Um, just because, like, okay. Um, can I plug in EH now? You should be able to, right? When I plug in EH, don't write the LIM, H goes to zero. That's just telling you what you had to do, and now you're actually doing it. So essentially what happens is, is that zero doesn't do anything. So it's just X minus one in that first radical. But if you have two radicals that are the same, can't you just add how many radicals you have, right? And so then I have two of those radicals. This is a good one because we will talk about how to get that in a shortcut way when we get to the next page. Okay. And it beats all this conjugate stuff by far. Okay. Oh, yeah, a whole lot easier. We won't get to that one actually, this specific problem, um, until we get to 3.4, but we will be able to do the derivative of this and get to this, okay? Um, but I'll show you why and how that happens, okay? We won't get to the other stuff inside the radical until we learn chain rule. Uh -huh. Chain rule, yeah. And that's in section four. And that's where I lose everyone because it is mind boggling. <laughs> that one, you really have to start learning how to see inside and outside. Do you remember composition back in the day? The F of G and G of S, all that good stuff. There was a reason why they taught it to you. <laughs> it's going to come back. Okay. Being able to identify insides and outsides, that's the hard part. Once you figure that out, and I'll give you some tips on how to know. Basically, what I always tell people is if your base of an exponent is not just x, or the inside of a radical is not just x, the inside of your trig function is not just x, then you have to apply the same. You don't have a choice. If the argument of your logarithm is not just x, you got to apply chain rule. Okay. Now, the last problem I have is number 10, like number 10. This one. Oh, yes, we're not done, right? You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, what is this? This is G prime. So, if I want to find M10, I have to find G prime of what number? It's up here. Five, it's the X value, right? Remember on the first page, we said that we have M10 is F of a specific X value. Okay. So I'm gonna plug in my specific X value, which is two, five, I'm sorry. So let's see what we get. One over two, five minus one which is the square root of four, what's the square root of four? So I have two times two, which is one fourth. 
Now, if I take this equation to figure out what B is, what was the Y value of my point? Two. My M was what? One fourth. The X was what? Five. So then this becomes two equals five fourths plus B. And then B will equal what? How would I get B by itself? Subtract five fourths. So I'm going to take two, subtract five over four, and it tells me that it is three fourths. So B is three fourths. And if you want, I'll write it down here so that we know what happened, right? These would go away. And then B would just be equal to whatever this value is. So what is the answer then? I have B and I have M, don't I? Both of them. So when I go up to the top, my final final answer is going to be M, which was one fourth X plus B, which was three fourths. Let's see. If not, I got to zoom out, right? I gotta zoom out even more. Jeez Louise. Okay, there we go. So in time, we have to plug in our x value. We did it. We figured out what the n was. Okay, then we plugged in that n. We plugged in our x. Plugged in our y. Solve this. However, you solve that. Solve that linear equation. Once you have b and you have m, it's just m minus the equation. M minus the that is the tangent line. So the tangent line is the line that touches that point of the graph at only that point. So I know I'm going to draw it next because that does well. But if you draw the curve, or I'm going to say I'm not sure, so let's say you have a parabola and then you have this point 5, 2, the tangent line only touches the graph at that one point. It doesn't touch the graph anywhere else. That's what tangent means. We're taking a different way to take both these two points. So secant line will cross the two points, the tangent line will cross the one point. And the significance of this is going to be when we get to chapter four. Yes. Exactly. But I have to do part B because I'm not done yet, which is to graph it. And I did mention that we were going to do it two ways. So one is the transformations, just because that's the fastest way to do it. So if you can do it, by all means do, right? But I have to graph this and this on the same line or on the same axis. Right? Okay. So this was my original function, right? F of X is a fancy way of saying Y. And then this was the line that I just found. Okay. So this one looks like a regular square root of x function, which looks like this. Right. And then because it has minus one, it's going to shift right one unit. Okay. So if I were to graph it, and I'm just going to do a mock graph. Instead of that little circle being here, it's going to be over here at one. Okay. And then instead of one squared is one, it's actually going to be one over to give me one. And then go in that direction. Okay. The other way to do it, if you don't remember transformations, is just to do this. You have to remember your domains of radicals. And for the domain of a radical, a radican, this is a weird word, I know. A radican has to be greater than or equal to zero, which is essentially just the inside of a radical. So if I have a radical, the inside of that radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. And if I solve this, it means all my x values of my graph have to be greater than or equal to one, okay? 
So this is option one to draw it. And then this is option two. So if I know that, then all I have to do, one, two, three, four, five, is make a table. Make sure you start at one and then only take X values that are greater than one. Since I'm talking about a 0.52, I'm actually gonna make sure that I include the 0.52, okay? But I'll take another one in the middle, like maybe three. Right, right. these are the numbers that they gave me. So I know it's gonna to touch there, right? So I'm gonna pick that one, okay? Now, if I plug one into my original function, what is one minus one? And the square root of zero? Zero. And isn't that the same exact point as my graph above? Okay. Then now three. If I plug in three, it's going to be three minus one, which is two. So I get the square root of two, which does not simplify. But at least I can know where it is. I don't know where square root of two is. It's like one point something. One point seven? One point four. Right, it's about 1.4, just like so I cannot know where it is. And then five, it is supposed to come out to two, but you can verify, right? Five minus one is four, and the square root of four is two, right? So here's, uh, I'm gonna do this by halves because I got a big number. So this is one and zero. This is three and 1.4 would be about there. And then five and two would be about here. So mine's in a much larger scale just because I have an idea of what I'm supposed to be heading towards, right? Then now I also have to graph this as well. I like this one because it's bigger. So I'm gonna graph my line on this one. Um, and I'll use a different color, I'll use red. So I know it's supposed to have this same point because that's literally how it's defined, right? It's the tangent line to that point by two. But from here, I should be going according to my slope, or you can just use your y-intercept. This is your y-intercept. And this is your slope, right? That's what m and b represented. So my y-intercept is 3 fourths, which means it's right there. How many points do you need to draw a line? Just two. So I could draw it just the way it is right now. Now, it's not going to come out all pretty because we know what it's supposed to do, right? It's supposed to just touch it at this one point because I'm not using graph paper or anything at this stuff at this one point. <laughs> but on your options in WebAssign, it will just touch at that one little point. Okay? That's the idea. You can use shifting or you can just use the domains and then just start plugging in numbers. Either way, you can get to that graph. And on there, they do have the options. So for me, I would have done option one and then just made sure that the lines have the correct intercept and it's like, like there are like graphs already on there. Okay, now we can get to this one. We may or may not finish it, but at least I can tell you how to set it up because that's the hard part. Okay, we have about 14 minutes left. Okay. Um, this one was weird. And I remember the first time I ever saw it, I thought it was really weird. I was like, what, what am I supposed to be doing here? I'm confused. Um, and then when somebody explained it, I was like, oh, well, I, I, I don't need to say that. <laughs> so now I'm going to make sure I'm going to make sure I do. Um, this one says, find the equation of the line that is tangent to this graph and parallel to that line. But they don't tell me what point it's tangent at, do they? So all I know, if I'm going to find the, the line, equation of the tangent line, I need to know what m is, right? And m can only be found at a specific x value. The problem is, is I don't know what the heck that x value is. Okay? So I cannot even tell you what m is for me. And then if I don't know m, I definitely can't figure out what b is. Okay? So there's a problem there. You have to figure out what that x value is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through all of the limit process to figure out what f prime looks like. And we know that f prime is a representation for this head. Okay. Then I'm going to actually figure out what this side is like, because these are supposed to be parallel, what relationship does this have? 
is just like it, but he says the sign is the square. Okay. Number 11 is the one that has the cube. But this is does have a lot of red in it, right? So yeah. this will be different for yours. Okay. So let's go through that limit process to figure out what F prime looks like. And it's not too bad, especially since we've already cubed. We kind of already know where that's going to go. So excuse me, but for time crunch purposes, I am going to go not super fast, but a little fast. But I am going to make sure I write everything. So that's just the definition. You don't have to write it every time. I just do. The more and more you see it, maybe the more and more you'll remember it, right? So I'm going to do x plus h cube minus x cube over h. I could put them in brackets, but I recognize that the brackets wouldn't be necessary, which is why I didn't write them. Because it's just one term. Yes, my F is a cube. Yes, you're asking me if I'm connected. If you don't, let me know. So this one, I'm going to use the uh, cut down triangle because we already did it before. So I know that that's x cubed with the coefficient 3x squared h with the coefficient 3x h squared and then h cubed. And there's only one term to subtract, so I'm just going to subtract x cubed. And then the x cubed wipe out. And then if I want to cancel out that h at the bottom, I need a factor of h, right? So I'm going to factor out an h. Yep. I forgot my x. That's what I forgot. So then now these wipe out. And instead of rewriting it, I'm just going to plug in the 0 for h. So what do I end up with? Just 3x squared. Because all of this is going to be a 0, and this is definitely a 0. You cannot do the shortcut in 3.1, because we don't know the shortcut in 3.1, right? <laughs> will I know if you're doing the shortcut when you're doing it at home? No. But if you're doing it on the test, will I know? Yes. But I'm just, I'm continuing to practice the same thing. Okay. But we will get it. <laughs> if we're waiting, we're like, I know it. Let me just do it already. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is in 10, right? This is in 10. In 10 is 3x squared. I just don't know what x put in there, so I get the actual number. Okay. But I do have this line over here, and supposedly this guy's slope is supposed to be the same as the slope of the tangent line. Because we said they had to be parallel. In order for me to do that, I essentially have to get y by itself. And for me, it is a whole lot easier just to add y to both sides to get y by itself. And then this is how it works, right? If imagine this point, this point square is the left hand side of my equation, and this is right side of my equation, right? If I'm looking at it like this, does anything change if I look at it like this? It's still there, right? But except on my perspective, it looks like this side is over here and this one's over there. So it doesn't matter which side you write it on. So when I swap them, don't go crazy on me. <laughs> it's the same thing, right? Instead of saying these two guys equal y, I it's still equivalent. 
Um, and then what is in them? Well, exactly, it's that number in front of X, right? So these two guys should be equivalent. And if they are, I'm going to solve for these X values. What do I do now? Square root, square root. I'm gonna put arrows just so people know where these came from, right? Um, and then when you do a square root, what do you get? Plus or minus. So you'll notice in that problem, and it was number one, number 11, right? It asks you for smaller x value and larger x value, okay? So you have to do both. There's actually two of them. So I'm gonna say for x equal to two, and then for x equal to negative two. The problem basically splits in half, okay? So there's two possibilities here. These are really right. Okay. So then for this one, remember y equals mx plus b. Do I know what m is? What is m? Almost. m is going to be 3 times what squared? Uh -huh. And so what is m? So then, and you know that too, right? Aren't they supposed to be two? So you have y equals 12x plus b, but I can't have x and b in here. I know what x is, what's x? Two. Do I know what y is? Remember that? Right, doesn't y equal f of x? So y equals f of two. And what is two cubed? So y equals eight. So I have eight equal to 24 plus b. And if I subtract 24, I get negative 16 equals b. So my equation would be y equals 12 for m x plus b, but b is a negative, so it'd be minus 16. And that's for one of them. Which one of these two is the smaller x value? This one. So when it gives you the boxes, make sure you put this one under the larger x value box, okay? Now the last one. So I know the y is going to be f of negative two. What do I get when I do negative two cubed? negative eight. So the y will be negative eight. The m is 12, the x is negative two, and that should let me find b. If I add 24, I'll get 16 positive. And so the equation is 12 for m and positive 16 for b. So make sure you put them in the right boxes. This one's for the smaller x value. And then this one's for the larger x value. Okay. Now the last part, I don't think I have the time, but I want to say almost have four minutes. Um, is just a note. Okay. So I don't nothing, I'm not doing the problems, but I wanted you to notice something. Um, so in here for problems 13, 14, and 15, it says that the functions are differentiable on their domain. They are uh, differentiable on the domain. So therefore, all you need to do for class 13, 14, and 15 is to enter the interval that represents the, each function's domain. And it says, hint, use the graph or algebraic slash arithmetic quantities slash facts. Okay? And these are the facts that I'm using. Denominators, we know, cannot equal zero. Right? So whatever x cannot equal means when you go from the interval negative infinity to infinity. Radicands, we know, must be positive. We actually did one of them, right? The inside of the radical must be positive. So you set the inside greater than or equal to zero. Solve it, and that gives you the domain. Just stick it in the interval. Okay? How do you stick x greater than one in the interval? x greater than one. 
than one, greater than or equal to one. What does that look like in an interval? I'm going to write it on here. So let's say I have this. I set the end point greater than or equal to one. I count it. What does the end point look like? Not parentheses, it's like a bar, right? So it's a bracket, so one, so what? Everything greater than one, so it's a positive thing, right? If I have a fraction, I know that that denominator cannot equal zero. So if I solve this little guy, I get that X cannot equal negative two. So the interval is supposed to be from negative infinity to infinity, but I now tell you to pick out two. So it needs to be negative infinity to negative two with the open, so you're not including negative two. And then on the other side of negative two for positive. Okay. And if you have two of them, two X values, let's say I get X cannot equal two and X cannot equal negative five. Then you have to break up the interval even more. You approach negative five first, then in between negative five and two, and then from two to positive two. Okay. To recap all that interval stuff. So I'm not telling you what the, what the domains are. I'm just letting you know that that's all you're trying to find. And then you try to connect the dots. If you get stuck, text me. Okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. If you have that, are they asking you for number eight? What are they asking you for on number eight? I'm gonna find out right now. Mm -hmm. But is it asking you for your domain? Well, you're gonna need it to graph it, right? Oh yeah. No, you don't have a you have a fraction. Oh no. Yeah, we did do that. Yeah. Let me grab this little paper. We did it. Where is that? Oh, here we go. So didn't I do that? I put my radicand greater than or equal to zero and all that. Only thing I didn't do was put this in an interval. But in numbers 13, 14, and 15, they specifically ask you for an interval. Okay. You're like, oh my God, I'm done. <laughs> totally understand. <I'm> <laughs> um, I do have to mention only because I'm going to be there, um, but there is an event happening today if you're interested. Not that you have to go, I can't even put it in here, but it's going to be in this green grass area from six to eight. They're going to have free food. I'm going to be there with all the math stuff. I'm going to have scholarship applications and all kinds of stuff on my little table, little giveaways. So they have free food, they have a band, all kinds of stuff happening. Yes. It should be unlocked. Did it lock you out? Let me see. But oh yeah, it'll say that it's late, but I don't know if it'll lock you. Let me check and see if it'll lock you. Ah uh, yes, it did lock you. Yep, yep, yep. It's not supposed to lock. I don't know why I locked it. I was creating a test at the same time. So I think on tests, I lock. <laughs> and so uh, I got copy and paste happy. So, yeah, that's it. You guys are done. You're just have a good weekend. Don't forget to watch the 3.2. Okay. And then we'll talk about 3.2. It's all about the shortcuts. It'll be a lot easier than today. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you have to take the question with the last one? Uh, wait, is that this one? Yes. Yeah, well, it's such a graph. Some videos are really helpful. Good, good. Very really helpful. Um, I asked, did I have to comment on this one more because I was watching three days videos. I watched their video first, then I watched six days videos, yeah. and then I forgot to comment. Yeah. We'll have to put it together. So, I guess I'm going to do that today. Yeah. That's right. Okay, I'm going to leave it. Okay. Thank you. 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 The event. It's from six to eight. Once I once I come back because I haven't created the actual applications, I gotta do that before six o'clock. <laughs> um, but once I have them, I'll bring them to class. Yeah. It's for um, usually the STEM majors, so math, engineers, computer science, all that. There's like criteria that you'll have to like do to get the money. Um, but I'll have that list I was just telling him. I haven't even created it yet. So I'm gonna create it today. And then if I have, not even if, if I have extras, I'll bring them. But if I don't, I'll print one and bring them on the day. Um, oh yeah, this you're not bad. This is a little bit of cleaning up. You're not bad though. You're no. you're pretty good. There's some that were like way off. But yeah, the ones that. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> you did good though. Good. You have a good one.